Hello, this is a uh, a sort of an introduction for the, our class together. Um, it would seem like an obvious question you would know the answer to if I asked you, do you speak English? However, your answer may be simple, but what that means and what that has historically meant in English literature is a far more complicated question than you may initially think it is. Um, the world of uh, the English language has radically changed. And if people who spoke English as it was spoken a thousand years ago spoke it to you, it is highly unlikely you would understand much of anything they said uh, at all. In fact, you wouldn't recognize their alphabet. So I want to talk to you about the evolution of the English language. A PowerPoint uh, that discusses a history of the English uh, language, what people spoke in English and how we. Um, you've surely heard that the Roman Empire uh, invaded as far as England um, and colonized there. Um, before they arrived, England was a tribal civilization that spoke Breton and Celtic. And those are neither of them much like what we have as English today. There was also Welsh. The Welsh remained largely unconquered by the Romans, so I haven't included them here. Um, Welsh is still spoken in, in, in some levels today. You can hear radio that has Welsh language spoken. You can hear um, uh, television shows in, in Welsh that are broadcast from Wales. Um, uh, Breton is uh, still surviving in a more modern form in a dialect in northern France, in the part of France known as Brittany. Um, it's not spoken by young people in school or anything, but some people have retained it uh, as a language that has a, a heritage for them, much like Cajun French is held today in Louisiana. And Celtic uh, thrives uh, in a more modern form in Gaelic in Ireland, um, a person can take the equivalent of the SATs in, in Gaelic and um, can do coursework, significant amounts of coursework, not just in English, but in Gaelic at the university. Um, and in Scot Scotland, uh, there are words um, that remain part of the language uh, of in a northern form of Celtic. Um, that is generally not spoken by people in school, but people learn this language as well. Um, then the Romans arrived and they took over the island of Great Britain. Uh, they brought Latin words that stuck, uh, at least uh, a few of them. We get the word mass, as in go to mass, uh, rather than uh, go to Catholic church on Sunday, go to mass. Um, and benediction, which is a word for blessing. Uh, we got both of those from Latin at that time. Um, and most of these words came with the church, as you can tell from the context I just gave you, uh, when Christianity became the state religion of Rome. Um, Christianity came to England at that time, but it didn't really take root. People uh, largely forgot about it um, and ignored it when the Romans left. Rome fell and the Romans had to leave. They had to go uh, to uh, back to the their capital city to defend it. So that was the end of both the Roman occupation of England and um, to a large extent for a time, the existence of Christian religion in England. Um, You've surely heard of the Dark Ages, and you've probably heard that at the fall of Rome, different tribes like the Ostrogoths and the Visigoths burned the libraries that the Romans had built. And this is a horrible thing, but I'm going to ever so slightly defend their motives, the people who burned these libraries. If America were invaded, by a foreign country that had a, an advanced technology that we did not have. And they used that technology in order to control and dominate us and enslave us. We very well might think about blowing up 
the places where they kept that technology. And the written word functioned as a colonial technology for the Romans in their occupation of Northern Europe. So without saying that we should burn a single book, much less a library, I nevertheless understand the impulse that brought that about. Um, here is what I said here. The tribal groups that invaded Rome from the north managed to largely destroy the tradition of literacy that had been part of the Roman system of colonial oppression. Uh, if there is nothing to read, it is hard to preserve literacy. Uh, and an untold amount of knowledge was lost with the burning of libraries. We don't know what ancient Europeans knew in quite the way that we would otherwise know and a, a, a marvelous number of um, pieces of literature that had been preserved since the ancient Greek days was uh, that was lost. There are poems uh, that were lost. Uh, there were plays that were lost. Uh, and there were uh, some advances in, in um, medicine um, that probably were lost to us at that time. Uh, the only portion of Roman society that survived was the Catholic Church, making them the guardians of literacy, um, but they really didn't try to spread literacy along with the religion. Um, there was a belief held by people in clergy that if people uh, could read, they could disagree with the people in charge of the church. Um, so while an elite in society was trained to read and write, almost exclusively men. Um, and uh, the clergy was certainly given access at higher levels to, um, to, to literacy. Um, but uh, you had to be basically a member of the royal family if you were outside of the um, uh, the church to, to be taught to read and write. One of the things that's interesting that one sees about the few women who did learn how to read during that period is on their tombs, they had pictures occasionally carved of them holding a book, which would be a sign not only that they were educated, but that they were also very high born because women who knew how to read and write were so few because they had to be members of truly the highest social classes, um, the very highest. And men who were captured uh, by police forces of different localities, if a man could prove that he could read and write, he was, they had to let him go because he might be on a secret mission for the church. You never know. Maybe people didn't recognize him, but maybe he had a holy reason to be in town. Maybe he was doing the work of the Pope, hence in the thinking of the Middle Ages, unquestionably God's own work. Um, so the Catholic Church used this as a very narrow uh, way to control information. And even the church abided in a worldview where the folkloric and mythological abided with the empirical. I talk about this in other parts of the, the uh, class. I did a funny video about the penitential of St. Patrick and werewolves in the land. Um, there is this idea that um, uh, everyone thought in the Middle Ages that things like unicorns might exist. Um, Dragons certainly existed. Even if you personally hadn't seen one, other people had seen them. You had heard the stories. Um, and so things that could be proven um, or were only part of what they believed in. They believed in a whole host of other things. It wasn't just what we would consider uh, Christian theology that was in the books, but these tales of dragons and witches and goblins and uh, werewolves, they all come from the Middle Ages. Um, and all physical manifestations were seen as signs of an unseen world that was more powerful and more important than our own. Uh, we had to uh, imagine that as we were talking, uh, demons and angels were wrestling for 
the destiny of our souls in heaven or hell. Um, more was going on than the human experience could allow humans to perceive was a commonly held belief. Um, and might made right in this world as most trials were conducted by ordeal rather than by any form of evidence. What I mean by that, and a trial by ordeal is something where people, um, let's say two men disagreed with each other in a court of law. Uh, he stole something that belonged to me and the other man claims he did not. It was not uncommon to make these two men fight to the death with one another and whoever won is the one who, whose claim was right because God wouldn't have allowed um, someone telling the truth in a court of law to perish. Um, so this was the world in which they lived that, that was part of what made the dark ages dark. Um, and Christianity was not pure as, as any Baptist minister worth his salt would tell you that this was bad Christianity. Um, Christianity became hybridized with many other religions practiced by local pagans all under the roof of the church, sometimes literally under the roof of the church. Um, in Naples, I'm sorry, not in Naples, in um, a town called Syracuse in um, Sicily, I saw a, a Catholic church that was literally built on the columns of a Roman temple to the god Apollo. Um, there was a whole cathedral built uh, in Belgium that was called uh, the Cathedral of Holy Wolf because the local um, uh, community had worshipped a wolf god. And there are towns throughout Central Europe called Holy Wolf because of the belief that a wolf god had something to do with them. Um, those were the Dark Ages. So I say, however, the Dark Ages were only dark for uh, Europe. The Middle East, the spread of Islam had come with an explosion of technology and artistic expression. Uh, that's important for us to note. Uh, that it was dark in Europe does not mean that it was dark in the Middle East. Um, to give you an example that is so literal, it is inescapable. You may know that the Islamic peoples invaded parts of Southern Europe. And uh, most notably, uh, they invaded Spain and successfully occupied Spain for centuries. Um, and near the palace of Alhambra, they had street lamps. They had a system by which street lamps were lit and there was running water. And that level of technology was not seen again for about seven or 800 years in the rest of Europe. Um, if you had the choice between seeing a medieval doctor who had been trained under Islamic states in the Middle East, or a medieval doctor who had been trained in the traditions of Europe, I guarantee you, if you want to live, you would choose the doctor who would learn in the Middle East, who had some basic ideas of, for instance, sterilizing things or giving medicines that might actually help the person, the cause and effects of disease without, of course, antibiotics or anything else that would help people in that level. But nevertheless, there was some common sense medicine that existed under Islam at this time that did not exist in Christendom in Northern Europe. Um, in North Africa and Southern Europe, the Moors built amazing cities that flourished, published great works of literature and invented music that still influences us today. If you like any music at all that includes a guitar, you like music that has its roots in this tradition. The guitar was invented at this time by Moorish Spain. In India, culture was at a great height during the Gupta period with glorious works of art and literature made. It would be impossible to overstate how magnificent some of these works were. Um, during this period, uh, we see all kinds of beautiful buildings built, all kinds of magnificent poems written, um, Europe, however, had a kind of a darkness. 
In China, civilization was also flourishing with the rise of Confucianism as a rational philosophy of governance and uh, with extraordinary achievements in architecture and engineering. Um, Chinese culture was doing quite well. Um, it, it was uh, founded on some ideas of good government. People shouldn't take bribes. They shouldn't make decisions on the basis of corruption or personality. But what would be best for the, for, for the smooth and uh, efficient running of a government? Um, uh, and so there, there were some very good and advanced things going on there too. Um, in sub-Saharan Africa, numerous civilizations emerged with sophisticated organizational systems for commerce, diplomacy, and agriculture. During the time of the Middle Ages, um, places like Timbuktu thrived. And when I say thrived, we're richer than any place that probably to this day has ever been. Um, and with universities that now, while we explore the books that have recently been documented for the first time by Harvard University and Henry Louis Gates Jr., we are able to see advances in areas like astronomy and accounting and medicine. And not all of the books that have been discovered were equally fabulous, but they were clearly at least four or 500 years ahead of the Europeans at this time. I wanna make this abundantly clear that the only place that fell into darkness in the dark ages was Europe particularly. Um, and all of these groups were more scientifically minded than the, all the Europeans. And here's what I mean by that. If there was an unexplained phenomenon, what was going on, um, they couldn't tell, but they would potentially look for a scientific methodological answer first with their limited tools available to them in order to solve a problem. And where someone found something that contradicted um, previous assumptions, they weren't burned at the stake as a witch for the most part. Um, around 600 AD, the Angles and Saxons invaded Great Britain. Um, you will see that I've given you this picture of a helmet. This is more than a helmet. This is a crown that a king was buried in at the, what's called the Sutton Hoo Memorial, uh, uh, Burial Mound, excuse me, the Sutton Hoo Burial Mound in England. You can see this in the British Museum. Um, gold was scarce and the little patches you see were all gold. And someone was buried in this to indicate that uh, he had uh, the, um, uh, what the Anglo-Saxons would have called the uh, rank of Drichten, which means warlord. He was a king of a tribe of people in uh, England at this time. Um, and we can see uh, similar artifacts uh, found throughout the British Isles um, that were left by the Angles and Saxons who came and formed a singular um, uh, group that had uh, emerged out of uh, Central uh, Europe, which in the area which would be uh, Germany. Today. And here are a few uh, facts about the Anglo-Saxons. They came originally from Eastern Germany. They were a warlike people. Uh, if you may have seen the video already where I, I wave around a uh, an imagined brandish weapon. They, they were constantly fighting with somebody, truly constantly. Um, and they pushed out the other tribes on the island to, into three other places, Wales, Scotland, and across the sea to Ireland, which is why, for instance, the Celtic language uh, flourished to the north and um, to, to uh, the, across the, the Irish Channel to, in Ireland. Um, they began to form not only their own society, but their own language that took on elements distinct from the Germanic language they spoke back on the continent. So they, they form a, a language that we now call Old English and has sometimes in other time, periods been called Anglo-Saxon English. Um, we get much of our language from them today, words like worship, uh, beer, 
I'm sure that's a word that you would like. And they also have a word we don't use anymore, which I think is a great shame because it's very descriptive. Um, if you have an awesome party and there's lots of beer flowing, there's a word for that in Anglo-Saxon English. It's beership. In other words, beership, not worship, beership. I think that's a very good word and it's a shame we lost it. Father, you have surely heard this word. Boat, we get that word from them. And sword, we get that word from them too. And Old English verse, Anglo-Saxon verse, does some things that are distinct. And we see this in our first readings of the class. I have here a part of what we are reading. Um, it, this is the, the excerpt from the Venerable Bede that's in your textbook. Uh, I've given it to you in the original. Um, Anglo-Saxon verse repeats consonant noises rather than rhymes. Often it is written in a form that contains in every line a caesura. Um, and a caesura is a, a sort of like a pause, a breath. And you can see it by the blank in the middle. And here is an example of a short poem by uh, Cadman, who's the first poem. Uh, this is the first poem in English that's recorded. And if any of you know the Christian band, it's all usually pronounced Cademan, Cademan's Call. Um, this is the call they're referring to in this, uh, in their name, this particular Christian rock band. Um, and this is what Cadman said in the original. Nu skulen hergan hefrene his word, metudes mechte on his mogadank, work ulder father, suhe undra gehaus, eke drichten, or a stelle de, he eriscop eldebarnum, hebin til hrofa, halag skepen, the midden yard, monis is where, eke drichten, efter tide, firem foldu, freya almetich. And what that means is, now we must honor the guardian of heaven, the might of the architect and his purpose, the work of the father of glory, as he, the eternal Lord, established beginning of wonders. He, the holy creator, first created heaven as a roof for the children of men. The Lord almighty afterwards appointed the middle earth, the lands, for men. And this reference to Middle Earth, let me underline it for you. See that? Ah, I cannot. Anyway, the reference to Middle Earth uh, is a um, reference that, that was written in the original. You can see this also in your text with the Midayar. What that means is just Earth between heaven and, and hell. Um, but J.R.R. Tolkien, when he wrote the Lord of the Ring trilogy, um, went to town with that and decided to create this land with elves and orcs and all the things that he created. Um, in the 800s, though, the Danes, meaning a, a, a southern group of Vikings, uh, invaded northern England. Um, and the Danes in England came in long boats, like the one pictured in the previous slide. And this was an advanced technology that allowed them to travel in war quickly. Um, and they began by making raids on northern towns. But then a few decided to settle where they had pillaged. Um, the Anglo-Saxons divided the, land, the island with them under a system called Dane law. Um, and we just get a very few words from the Danish in English, but one of them is very important. The word the comes from those Vikings. The word bask is in, I'm going to bask in the sun. We get that from them. We get the word skirt from them. There really aren't a lot of uh, Danish Viking words that have entered English, but the, for instance, is a word we, it would be hard for us to imagine not having. But a much bigger change happens in 1066. What you're looking at a picture of here is the Bayeux Tapestry, which is the historical commemorative uh, uh, depiction 
of the invasion of the Normans. And unlike the Anglo-Saxons uh, who were constantly fighting with each other, the Normans came largely unified. They had slight feudal infighting, but really they were there to, to, as a group under William the Conqueror. And they, they had come to take over and to stay. Um, and uh, the Danes uh, were not even sure they were ever going to quite stay. They were Vikings, so they were um, somewhat nomadic. Um, but the Normans changed than really anybody else before them. They come from northern France, but they had originally been of Scandinavian descent. They bring early French with them. And early French then becomes a language of government. Uh, for three centuries, all government business takes place in this French and the royalty and the aristocracy speak in French, while the language I just spoke to you of Old English is spoken by the merchant class, such as there is one, although they have to learn the French too in order to deal with the royals, and the farmer class while the church continues to do its business in Latin. The peasants speak Anglo-Saxon still. And as a result, though, over centuries of being together, just for the sake of expediency, they end up with a new version of English. This is a uh, part of what we are reading uh, when we read L'Enval a little bit later, I think it's next week, we're going to read this, um, by Marie de France, who was an Anglo-Norman woman, meaning she lived in England, was born in England, um, was of the royal class so she could read and write, um, and she was a writer of the 13th century. And uh, this is her prologue to L'Enval, which we are going to read. And this was written in England for an audience living there. This is also English. Just listen, just listen. This is English. Et plus fur subtil de sens et plus se savoir garder de ce qui est à trespasser, qui devait se volte défendre, estudier, dit et entendre, et gros vos œuvres commencer par ce puis plus se soigner et de grands douleurs délivrer pour ce commencer à penser d'aucune bonne histoire à faire. That's English. Two, can you believe it? That is English. During this time, there were three languages spoken and written in England, as I said before. The aristocracy spoke and wrote in Middle French. That's the language that I just spoke to you. The church wrote and spoke in Latin. In fact, the church continues most all its business in Latin until the 1960s, so 50 years ago was when they included additional languages in their business. Um, the ordinary people spoke, but neither read nor wrote in Anglo-Saxon that was becoming increasingly influenced by the French. So the Anglo-Saxon bends to take, to take on the words of the French. The Normans conquered both England and English. And we get a lot of words from Anglo-Norman. They would include administration, abandon, abbey, adventure, adversity, age, agree. And those are just some of the words that begin with A. The whole English language has French inflected words within it, even though it retains a Germanic root for most all of them. The Normans would travel regularly between France and England, and they saw the land even though it was divided by the English Channel as one country. This is true until you get to the Hundred Years' War. France and England, this is, England is just part of France as far as everybody is concerned in the royal But in the 1300s, the Norman aristocrats had to choose a side of the English Channel on which to live. There was a monarchy crisis in France. A guy who had been a very dominant force as king died suddenly without an heir. Um, and it looked like 
the most likely person to take over was his cousin, the King of England. But the French didn't want anything to do with that. They did not want some English dude coming over and telling them what to do as king. They didn't trust him. So a uh, very long, they got into a fight. Uh, the English king got into a fight with the French king because they named someone else in the 1360s. That meant Norman settlers had to make a choice. Were they English or were they French? Because there was a war that had broken out. And in 1362, King Edward III, who, by the way, built Windsor Castle, where that recent royal wedding happened. If you saw that on TV, that old castle comes from his era, made English the official language of his kingdom. No longer would anything governmental use French, which meant that French was no longer an aristocratic language, which is huge for who speaks, reads, and writes. Some Normans, not very many, chose to go back to France. Many more stayed in English. And as a result... English was the official language, but French was all over English already. So what would they speak then? What was? And so we end up with something called Middle English. What the Anglo-Saxons spoke, that first poem I read to you, that is called Old English. The mid-1200s to the mid-1400s was an extraordinary period for the English language. Many, many more people were becoming literate, at least partially literate. Among them were women of merchant classes, uh, of, of classes where people might be high placed in clergy, um, lower aristocrats, not just royal class people were speaking, uh, reading and writing in English. Uh, men were almost certainly functionally literate if they were um, successful enough to own a thriving shop in a town. Um, anybody who was a sheriff would be able to read and write instructions in some form of basic English. Um, so we end up with a lot more people who can read and write. Uh, people started writing in the English vernacular. The word vernacular means that instead of uh, uh, the language of another place like Latin, they are speaking the local language. V vernacular means the way that people speak in real life. If you use the word ain't, you are speaking in the vernacular. If instead of saying, where are you, you say, where you at, you are speaking in a vernacular expression because the correct grammar in uh, high English today would be, where are you, not where are you at. Um, instead of Latin, that, so they speak, write, started writing the English vernacular instead of Latin or early Middle French. A vernacular English written was a very new thing indeed at this time. People started to read in a language many more people knew in society at large. If you went to the equivalent of the university um, uh, or high school in um, in England up until this point, everything was written in Latin or Greek. Um, maybe if you were studying the law, you would read a little French, but really and truly, you were using something other than the language of the streets, English. Um, and so the language that emerged that became Middle English was a patchwork of Anglo-Saxon, Danish, French, and the combination became something else altogether. Um, and this is one of the texts we're reading. I'm going to read you the first uh, stanza of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which is in your reading list for what to read for this course, in the original Middle English. Sit in the sage of the, and the assault was assessed in Troia, the boar Britain and Brent to Brondes and asks, the, the tilk that the tramas of treason were the rot, what treed for his tricheria the truest on earth. It was Aeneas the Athel and his Hyacind that sith in depressed provinces and patronas become well nay of all the well in the West dealers. For rich Romulus to Rome riches him sweet with great bobons that bury 
he bears upon first and never initiates his own norm as it now had. Tedious to Tuscan and Tildes beginners, Langeberg in Lombardy left his up homers, and fell over the French flood Felix Brutus on money bonkers, for broad Bretagne he setteth with winna. That doesn't sound like the English you and I speak, but it sounds more like that than either of the two earlier versions I read to you. This is English at the time of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which is written at the end of the 1300s. Um, and notice, look at this, this passage for a minute. Do you see letters of the alphabet that don't exist now? This is how they were writing. This is not our current ABC alphabet. There are some changes here. Some letters in Old and Middle English that we don't have anymore would include this, which is the letter thorn. It makes the sound th as in the. And this also makes it the letter, the, 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 the sound th as in the. Um, and it's called the letter F. And these could be used interchangeably. There was no standard spelling up until really the 1800s for English. And this is the letter yo, and it makes both the sound, uh, you might see it at the end of a word like laugh, uh, and it also makes the sound of a modern Y. Um, uh, so these are things that, that existed in the language until we get to Shakespeare's time. Um, so again, I ask you, do you speak English? I think you see now that this is not an as entirely simple a question as you thought it was. Um, English changes continually. Think about the hip hop lyrics that your grandma doesn't understand and the text message abbreviations that even your parents don't understand. Um, what will people speak a thousand years from now when they speak English? We simply do not know. There's a good chance that they would not understand us.